Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum flies away, pumps it in, 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big Three NBA podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Hey everyone, this is the Big Three NBA podcast. I'm Kwani Lunas with HR Blakely and Gary Washburn. Miami is headed to Cancun. Bye <laughs> bye. And the Celtics put them away. As you know, game five win, 118 84. Jalen Brown and Derek White, White both with 25 points. Jason Tatum with 16 and 12. That was a fun series. You know, they had us in the first half, but they closed out with a very solid win in game five. But overall, with this series, who would you guys say? Let's start from the top. Who would be the series MVP of this round for Boston? I'll go with the closer, Derek White. Mm. D. White came through when they needed him. Because, I mean, look, you go back and you look at the numbers and just the way that Jalen Brown and Tatum played those last couple of games, and you'll and you'll see what Derek White was able to do. There's no doubt he was the guy that put them over the top. And that's what you need this time of year. Your, your best players are not always going to play their best games, and you still got to find ways to win. And the Celtics were able to do that in large part because of what Derek White did. I thought the last couple of games, not only was he scoring the ball more, he seemed to be a little bit more engaged defensively. You know, they, they had that drop coverage that they love to do. I thought Derek did a really good job of sticking with that drop coverage, but making sure that he closed off any and all airspace for guys like Tyler Hero and, and Caleb Martin and anyone else he had to defend. Uh, I thought he was the guy that was the difference maker for them getting over the hump and going on to the second round uh, of the playoffs. Yeah, I agree. It was Derek White. I mean, Jason and Jalen, neither of them had great series. They had moments in the series that were that were good. But Derek White, mostly every game was just, you know, just tremendous. I mean, just taking advantage of every opportunity he got, um, scoring the ball at the rim, hitting threes, making defensive plays, just being a complete menace for the Miami Heat. And the Miami Heat had absolutely no answer for him. I mean, no answer for him. And that's what they needed. You know, the Celtics were challenged in game two, and they need to know that they can win a series without Brown and Tatum being great. I mean, let us Let's look at the numbers. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Derek White, 22.4 points, 57% from the field, 47.7% from the three-point line. Just immaculate series. Jason was not great, not a good series for him. 21.8, 41% from the field, 29% from the three-point line. Did not have a good three-point series. Also missed nine free throws in the series. So he needs to be better. Um Jalen led the team in scoring 22.8, seven rebounds, 52% from the field, 32% from the three-point line. So if you put Jason and Jalen together, they hit 18 threes in the series. Derek hit 21. So shows you the value of Derek White. It shows you how much he has become just a staple. I mean, you know, you didn't get a lot out of Drew Holiday, seven, eight points a game. Chris Stapps in his uh, four games, you know, 12 points, uh, five boards. But Derek White just shined, I mean, completely. Just a, 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 a dominant series on his side. Only six turnovers and 170 minutes of action. Five blocks, two steals, 16 assists. I mean, just a complete series. And only got to the free throw line 10 times and hit nine of those. So even though he was had a lot of action and a lot of usage, didn't get to the line because he doesn't get a lot of calls, but just a, a dominant series for Derek White. And he was the complete reason why they won the last three games and they got Miami the hell out of there, which they needed to do. It was a relief, I think, to everybody because I think people believed, as rightfully so, that Miami was going to take this series deep just because of Spolstra and because mm -hmm. uh, some wacky things might happen. But after game two, order was restored. Derek was great. The rest of the guys played good defense, shut down Tyler Hero. But the MVP, unquestionably, if there was an MVP of the first round, is Derek White. Unanimous vote. I think we all agree with that one. And then looking at the roster even more, who would you say was the most improved? Which I mean, it could be argued that Derek White is also the most improved, but <laughs> which rock? 
the most improved? You know what? I'm gonna go with Sam Hauser. I'm gonna go oh, with yeah. I'm yeah. gonna go with Sam because I I thought as the as the series went on, Sam got a little bit stronger, a little bit more impactful. Uh, and his defense, I thought, got better. Because I thought the first couple games, he wasn't nearly as solid defensively as we'd seen throughout the regular season. And again, Sam ain't locking nobody up. Uh, clank, clank, that's not happening when Sam is defending you. But he's very good at keeping himself between the rim and the, the person who he's guarding. I didn't think he was very good in the first couple games. The last three games, I thought he was much better. And it seemed that as the shot started to fall a little bit, his defense got a little bit better, uh, became a little bit more impactful. Uh, and that was good to see because they are going to need Sam Hauser to win a championship. They're going to need someone that they can rely on to knock down shots uh, in a very limited amount of time. And that's the thing that he does well. He, he had, To me, he has one of the best jobs in the NBA. He plays on a team with multiple starters who have shown the ability to score at an elite level and your job to score. Yeah. When they get you to rock, just shoot, let it fly. That's what you're supposed to do. Be solid defensively and get us some buckets offensively because those two other guys that you're playing with, they're going to draw enough attention that you're going to get some looks that you otherwise wouldn't get. If let's say you're playing on a team like Miami, yeah. uh, you wouldn't be, you, those clean looks would not exist. Not as clean as they are. So, I thought he got better as the series progressed. And, and they're going to, again, as I said, he, they're going to need that to win a championship. I got to agree again with Gerard, unfortunately. See? Sam Hauser was very good. 12 for 25 for the three-point line. Eight points a game in 17 minutes. So, you know, just scored basically a point every two minutes um, to help the team. And and just was uh, like Sherrod said also was offered resistance defensively too, you know, and, and picked up 11 rebounds, a couple of rebounds, you know, like not a, you know, a high amount, but enough 11 rebounds in five games, 2.2 rebounds a game. That's what you want out of a guy. Just do little things, three assists, a um, couple of steals, a block, like at a dunk. Yeah. Dunk. Do whatever it takes for you to win. In, in your minutes, be a star in your role. And that's what Sam Hauser was because not everybody had a great series. It was, a you know, Pritchard wasn't particularly good, you know, in the series. Luke Cornett had his moments. Drew Holiday was okay. Um, you know, I thought, I thought he was decent, especially, you know, for the three point line, he was okay at his moments defensively. He shut down hero, but Hauser, I think everybody's been waiting. I mean, I think last year he really didn't get a much of an opportunity. This year he has flourished and he has had a, has a bona fide role. And I just think we've been waiting to see can Sam Hauser, can Peyton Pritchard, can Luke Cornett flourish in the playoffs? Not against Charlotte on a Tuesday night when they're up 25 points, but in a critical playoff game when you get critical first quarter minutes, when you're trying to help your team create a build a, a lead and he came in there in the second unit midway through the first quarter and obviously as you could say Sharab that first game one when he hit those threes it was kind of close I remember it was 26 21 in game one after the first quarter the Celtics had jumped out of that big 14 nothing lead Miami kind of chipped away and it was like okay this might be a a struggle of a game this is going to be a tough one because the heat of kind of leveled it off, and they're going to make this a low-scoring battle. And there, what happens, Hauser hits four three-pointers in the second quarter, and suddenly I think the lead was 15 at halftime, and the Celtics went on to cruise. So those are, those are key minutes, you know, and that's what you hope in the next couple of series, like affect the game early, game one, game two, get your team victories, do the little things, and that's where you become an MVP of your role and that's where you become more valuable off the bench. Exactly, Gary. Because ain't nobody doing it the way Sam Hauser does off the bench. You know that. <laughs> ain't true. nobody doing it the way Sam Hauser does off the bench. You love the enthusiasm. Yes. <laughs> Overall, what would you say? I feel you. I feel you, Sharon. I feel you. <laughs> That's my dog. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, not what kind of forever. All right. If, if, if folks, if you don't, if you don't know our references, Kwani kind of has a Chaka Khan look today. Oh my God. <laughs> Google Chaka Khan. 
Google Z-A-R- Chaka Khan. I'm Z-A-R- talking about in her prime, 1980s Chaka Khan. Yeah. And Play some of her music on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, you will never, you will not, you will, you will thank us forever playing some Chaka Khan. Right. After oh. you watch this on YouTube, of course, yeah. if you watch it on YouTube, finish the episode. Ain't nobody does it better than Chaka Khan. Ain't nobody. <laughs> Price Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Price Picks is so easy to play. I can make my Celtic picks and make my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Price Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Celtics and NBA fans, you can get in on prize picks in 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. On prize picks this week, I'm selecting Jason Tatum to dish out more than five assists and his teammate Jalen Brown to have more than 22 and a half points. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Prize picks. Moving on. Lessons learned from this heat series. Fill in the blank. What you got, Gary? Um, you know what? Take your opponent seriously. Don't slip that game too. And I'm not gonna come down. Oh, they were terrible. You know, they missed some shots. Miami got hot. It was kind of an anomaly. It was an outlier, what? an aberration. Any word you want to use, but don't slip. Like be be constant, keep making adjustments, even off victories. And you should, the Celtics are good enough to beat anybody pretty handily at this point. When they get to the finals, we'll see about that. But I just think they learned, like, you know what? Teams are not going to lay down for us. And we're going to have to win in different ways. And it's not always knocking down three-pointers in the series. They were, let me look at my, you know, hood stats. stats. 38.5% 38.5% from three, nice average, 75 for 195. That's a good average, right? Um, not stupendous. They didn't shoot 50% or anything like that. But, you know, about what they shoot during the regular season. But they also won this game with defense, with rebounding, not letting Miami get second chance points. Like all the other intangibles, they won this series not only with with their offense. They didn't. Their offense wasn't great. One game they scored 104 points. Um, you know, I think their best offensive game was was last you know night 118, but and they scored 102 in game four. So some of these were, were rock fights, but they were dominant in those rock fights because they defended, they rebounded, they didn't let Miami get 50 50 balls. You know, that's how teams can stay close making those hustle plays, you know, getting the second, getting the second chance points, you know, knocking away the loose ball and getting run outs and fast break points. Not at all. The Celtics dominated those statistics. And so to me, the lesson they learn is don't take your opponent lightly. I think they, they understood that. And two, if you dominate other things besides three point shooting, other scoring, you'll still win pretty handily, even though some of those shots aren't going down. They Some of those games, they weren't great behind the three-point line, but they were good enough. And then Miami couldn't score. Miami couldn't get second chance points. Their defense was good. They, re, they dominated the boards, you know? And so it's not only the Celtics shot Miami out, out the arena, they also dominated the other, all the other statistics. And that's the thing. I mean, that's what you have to do. They out-rebounded Miami 228 to 181. So that's what, about 40? Ooh, boy, do my, do my ghetto math. 28, 19, 47. Two, and then you do the 47. Plus. So they out-rebounded them from, from uh, 28 and 181, 19, 47, <laughs> over five games. They down, that's almost nine rebounds. Or that's nine and a half rebounds a game. That's going to make a difference. That's going to get you victories the little things. And that's how you beat teams like Miami that play hard, that that are, don't give up. Because in as much as I think that this was, yeah, Miami was shorthanded, no Butler, no Azir, uh, no Josh Richardson, and Hami Hawkins missed game five. This is the hardest playing team 
they'll have they'll play in the playoffs and the most well coached team they'll play in the playoffs. So this was a good test for them, and I think they passed with flying coats. Yeah, the the, uh, the the lesson in this is, is that at the end of the day, your north star has to be your defense. Because when you play that side of the ball at a high level, it doesn't matter what you do at the other end of the floor. You're going to find a way to win because your defense is that good. And I think sometimes they lose sight of what, frankly, is going to be successful in the postseason. They're still, in many respects, living off of that regular season glow where they can go out there, they can play mediocre defense some days, but just knocking down shots and win by like 20, 25 points. This time of year, you're not going to shoot the ball nearly as well. We see this year after year after year. Offenses have a much harder time being impactful and efficient when you get to the playoffs. But defense, if you have an elite defense, you're going to have a chance to win every single night if you're playing close to your best. And I thought that in the games that they won, their defense was dominant. I mean, that has to be what their focus is on going forward. I, I think, and, and again, that's... I don't know whether that's one of those Joe Mazzula needs to really, really talk about that and, and speak that into existence, or whether that's one of those things where Tatum uh, or Jalen or one of you know Al Horford or some one of their leaders or multiple leaders need to talk more and more about that so that it doesn't just become a talking point. It becomes a way of life uh, because that, if you're going to win a championship, has to be the path. I don't care what how well Tatum is knocking down shots. If you're not putting the clamps on kids defensively, you are going to not win a championship because there are too many teams that you're going to have to go through. If you get through the East, which they should, you look at all the teams that are still hanging around in the West, you're going to have to play great defense against any team that you face coming out of the West because they have a certain DNA about them that makes it so that if your defense is not straight, you're going to get sent straight home for the summer. One, two, three, Cancun. That's going to be your, your mantra if you don't get your defense right. And I thought the Celtics, when they were locked in at that end of the floor, they were good. I mean, they, they, they were beating Miami by 20 points, like in game four, and they weren't very good offensively. But their defense was really good. They were forcing turnovers. They were doing all those little things, as Gary pointed out. But the big thing is their defense, and that has to be the mindset. Uh, anything short of elite play defensively, opens a Pandora's box of problems for you that can wind up you getting your ass whipped if you're not careful. So defense has to be the lesson that they take away from this first round series against Miami. That has to be at the top of their, we got to get this done every night list. Hey everyone, this is Kwani Lunas from the Big Free NBA podcast. As you know, we are very excited to see where the Celtics end up throughout this playoff round. And of course, as a result, it's always cool to attend games when you're following along with your favorite teams. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. They have prices on their app that actually go down closer to tip off, which makes it easier to get a good deal. And with killer last minute deals and all in prices, also a view from where your seat will be. They also guarantee low prices and Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying those tickets. All you need to do when you're on the app is pick out a specific game or matchup. All you need to do is go into the app and pick out that Boston matchup that you'd like to attend, look for a good deal, and just either wait it out or select the ticket right away. They have different features in the app, such as customizing your spot. Take all the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem that code CLNS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Moving on, Porzingis, I, I, there actually was a photo of him leaving the game yesterday without a brace, which I don't know if that really means much. But what is your level of concern over the fact that it seems as though the Celtics may have to play without him? A little bit longer. I, I think it's going to be a little bit more than a little bit longer. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I would. I, it wouldn't shock me if he doesn't play a single game in the next round. Uh, would not yeah. surprise me. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's why the matchup they face, I think, is important. Um, you know, it, 
not having Porzingis looks a lot different against Cleveland, for example, than not mm-hmm. having Porzingis against Orlando. That's true. Uh, and, and so that 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 to me is is really you know for the Celtics, it goes back to what I said earlier about just that defense. It has to be there, and whether he's in there or out there or not, it has to be there. Uh, my concern level for him uh, is not real high because I still think that the Celtics can get past whatever team they face in the next round of the playoffs without Porzingis. Uh, it's that final layer, that final mm-hmm. round to get to the NBA Finals where I think you really need to have him because at that point, all the chips are on the table. It's it's then you, you have to get it done in that moment. You have to find a way to get past that one last team that's standing between you and a legitimate chance at winning a championship. And that is, to me, that's the hands, all hands on deck portion of the program. You can beat Cleveland, you can beat Orlando without him. It's just not going to be a quick series. It's probably going to be a six or seven game series because uh, those teams, they have different strengths and they come at you in, in a different manner. But at the end of the day, both of them, I think, are de- defenses is something that they, they kind of hang their hand, especially Orlando. Orlando has all that damn length uh, everywhere. And, you know, they got a wild card in Jonathan Isaac, who if he play, if that dude could play 25, 30 minutes, Orlando's probably a top two, top three team in the East uh, because he's that impactful in the 15 or so minutes he plays. But, you know, Banchero, you know, all-star type of season. And and you start going down the line, so many of the, the Wagner brothers who are a one-two punch problem, especially the one that got traded from Boston, he still still look play a little salty against Boston whenever they, when he see them. Like, y'all do realize that y'all, y'all, y'all cut me loose for nothing, right? I'm going to make, I'm going to remind you why that probably wasn't the wisest thing for you to do. Mm-hmm. So, the Celtics, again, I, I think having Porzingis, it certainly complicates things a little bit for Boston, but I think it, it becomes more of a bump in the road as opposed to a pothole that's going to leave your car disabled in the middle of, 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 of you know, 90. By 90? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm concerned, like, in terms of the next round. I think if you give him three weeks, and that's probably the, con- the start of the conference finals around that time, I think he'll be okay. Now, I don't think this is like a six-week injury. I think it's maybe a two- to three-week injury. And I'm sure he's putting in all the rehab, and they're going to be very cautious with him. I'm not as concerned. I think in in terms of matchups, they have enough depth at center to be okay. You've got only not, not only have Horford, Cornette, you got – uh, the man that we really haven't talked about much, and that's Xavier Tillman. And I think he can be a difference maker in this series. And then you got Kata. Like, if you need, they've got four legitimate bigs. That's why you sign Kata for the playoffs. We talked about that during the year. Should they sign into the playoff roster and sign no contract? They did. Tillman, we haven't seen much of him. We saw a little bit of him in game five, um, playing some some garbage time minutes or whatever. But I think he'll get some minutes. And I think what's interesting to know about whoever the next series, if you've looked at the Cleveland, both those teams can look really good and look really bad. Yeah. Like Cleveland couldn't have, was world beaters the first two games, go to Orlando and just literally look like, uh, you know, the look, look like the Charlotte Hornet, look like a, the worst team in the NBA. Look Charlotte like Hornets on a Tuesday, Gary. Yeah, Charlotte Hornets Tuesday on a Tuesday. Night. Tuesday. <laughs> they look like they look like you know, East Side High. Like they look horrible, right? And then they kind of fight. And then Orlando does the same thing. Orlando play looks looks like terrible or not good the first two games, and comes back. So that's the youth of the playoffs. Those are two teams that are still trying to figure out their playoff identity. Right when you look so good at home, if you look if you look at the Celtics, like they don't look great at home, they look great on the road. The Celtics can beat you anywhere, especially on the road. They're not gonna come into a road venue and just look absolutely horrible, right? That hasn't happened all that much. I think the one game three last year at Miami was the one that was like that was probably the worst game of the Missoula era, but. If you look at the Celtics, they can win anywhere. And if you look at the Magic or the Cavs, you know, they can beat you, but they can also look inept. 
And that's the thing about, I think, the next opponent that gives the Celtics an advantage and may give them a break with Porzingis out is if the Celtics play steady ball, have a good game plan, they have more than enough without Porzingis to beat both teams in, to me, five or six games. I'm not talking about they're going to sweep them or whatever, but five or six games. Because I just think you can get one in Orlando, you can get one in Cleveland or whatever, and you just protect home court. You play steady ball. They played steady ball besides game two. And I'm not going to say game two, they they had some turnovers. They missed some shots. Porzingis was just flat, minus 32. So that was a strange game. But they still, with a couple of plays here and there, could have won that game, right? They still could have pulled it out by three or four points. I'm not talking about they would have blown them out. That was the toughest game of the series, and they just couldn't make any plays toward the end of the game. But if you look at Cleveland and Orlando, just look at them, their flaw. Cleveland, Orlando does not have a point guard. Like Markel Fultz, if you, I look at the fourth quarter of that Cleveland game, at game five, Banchero's running the point forward, trying to create, initiate offense. He's not that guy yet. He's very good. But the reason they struggled is they don't have a freaking point guard. They don't trust Markel Fultz, right? They don't trust Fultz. Uh, Cole Anthony was a note, was disappeared. He was on a milk cart in that game. And then Jalen oh Jalen Suggs was like a he's he's kind of their point guard, but he hasn't worked out there yet. So he's kind of like a defensive guard. So Orlando's got their weaknesses. Cleveland is mad inconsistent at times. So the Celtics, if they play solid ball without Porzingis, should be able to advance in five or six games, in my opinion. All right, you tee this up perfectly. Up next, we know either the Cleveland Cavaliers or the Orlando Magic. Which would you two prefer to see, and what would be your concerns if the Celtics were to match up against either one of them? Even though you kind of started answering it, Gary. Go ahead, Gary. Finish what you started. Oh, I yeah. mean, my, my concern is size, obviously. Like, Orlando beat the Celtics in Orlando this year during the playing tournament game. They kind of bullied them. They were really, really physical. Um, Like, Sherrod mentioned, Mo Wagner had a big game. It was got kind of everything, I think. And I think Porzingis, I don't know. If, I think he might have gotten hurt in that game, too. Um, that was a, that was kind of a strange game where the Celtics Tatum wasn't good. It was just one of those kind of funky games. And if you look at the one they lost against Cleveland, we all know the Dean Wade game. And I don't think Dean Wade's there. I think he's out for the season now. So there'll be no Dean Wade <clears throat> miracles, but I just think the size of those two teams Orlando is a big physical team. Cleveland has two bigs and Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Donovan Mitchell always will put a fright into you because that dude is like Dwayne Wade, you know, modern day Dwayne Wade, just with his physicality, his ability to get to the basket. And then Karis Levert has always played well against the Celtics. So both teams have potential to take one or two games and, and make it a long series. Um I think Orlando is probably a better matchup because of their inexperience. Um, and I think the Celtics can game plan, but Cleveland, both teams. And remember, Cleveland, like J.B. Bickerstaff's job might be on the line because I think there's kind of an impatience in Cleveland where you got Mitchell and you got Garland and you got Levert and you got these guys here. And like, y'all can't get out the first round. So... This is a big series. This Orlando's game. This is a big series for Bickerstaff. And the next game, the next series, I'm sure will be big too. But I, I think both teams have the potential to take them to deep series. But I think probably Orlando might be the better matchup because of their inexperience, their lack of a true, real true point guard. And then Orlando has trouble scoring. They're going to have to make every game a rock fight. Do you have an answer, Sharad? Yeah, Sharad. Right. <laughs> he just said facts. Facts. <laughs> he said, "I agree." Facts. No, it's it, the team. The team that I would I worry more about is Cleveland, and and the reason why because Cleveland has I think the type of identity 
that the Celtics don't necessarily have the strength to combat. They have size. They have length. And they have two guys, you know, in, in, in Mobley, you know, and another big fella, you know, Allen, that can cause you problems at the Celtics. Both of those guys are real, particularly Jared Allen, has gotten significantly better as a player uh, and I think can cause some problems if they're not careful. Uh, so to me, Cleveland is the team that I would not want to necessarily face. I'd rather see Orlando uh, because, I, again, Cleveland, I, I see them as a team that can – you can still beat them, but I think Cleveland's going to make you work harder to put them away. Uh, Orlando, I think, is a team that by simply doing what you do well defensively, you're going to put them in, in a position where they can't score. And even when your guys have subpar score performances – you're still good enough to put up 110 points on the team, uh, even though you, even if you're not playing or 100 points on a team, and that's to me a much easier path to getting out of the second round and onto the conference finals if it's Orlando that you're dealing with. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, though, the guy to me, if if you're facing Orlando, that I worry about uh, if I'm the Celtics is a guy like Jonathan Isaac. You know what Benchero is going to do. You know what the Bogner brothers are going to do, but. You know, it's those other guys that are going to play who can make an impact on the series. And Isaac, to me, he's just a, he can score, he can rebound, he can defend, he can do all the things that guys his with his size and length want you want them to do, but can't. Uh, and I worry about a series against Orlando if he is playing the way that he's capable of, because when he's on he's really on at both ends of the floor that's what makes him such a unique talent um but like i said in a best of seven uh i definitely see the celtics winning it in six or seven but it's not going to be easy uh cleveland i think will be a, a tougher challenge but orlando's not going to be no walk in the park either and with that being said the final portion of this episode Fill in the lane. Blank needs a big second round series for Boston. Who is it? Tatum. Mm -hmm. Tatum. 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 Oh, listen. God, Tatum God. got basically got a vacation in his first round. Uh, I, I know we had four double doubles and one triple double. Uh, you know, against Miami, but you never really felt that he had a game where his imprint was on the game. And they're going to need that at this point going forward because this this is a time when your best players shine. This is a time when your best players lead you to vic not just victory, but they just lead you in overall impact of the game. This is Tatum's time to put his stamp on this this postseason run for the Celtics because you look back at the first round. You know, Derek White big game. Jalen Brown was the lead scorer. Uh, it's and with no Porzingis, they're really going to need Tatum to step up even more so. Uh, so to me, that's the guy that they really need to have a big series because he didn't have one last round, and I don't think they can necessarily count on another subpar Tatum series, and that's still leading them to, out of the second round and into the conference finals. Yeah, I'm going to agree with it. Tatum has to step up and be big. And I'm not talking about, I mean, he can do the all around stuff, rebounding playing defense, uh, being a more of a playmaker. But I'm talking about, like, scoring, getting, like, not standing in the corner. There's a couple plays last night. He just, like, like, he wasn't part of the offense, and he just stood in the corner with his hands on his hips. Like, he needs to be more moving around a little bit more and more active. And maybe, you know, the, the ankle might have been bothering him a little bit, and the Celtics didn't really need him um, with Brown and White kind of going off. But you need – premium Tatum in this series. You need him to, in this next series, you need him to lead the way. It can't always be Derek White. And, you know, I trust Jalen too, but I think Tatum's got to step up, knock down those three pointers, get to the rim. He got a lot of free throw attempts in game five. I think that's good. It's a good sign. You just be a complete player and take advantage of your scoring opportunities. And, you know, I know he likes to kind of, uh, you know, give way to, to to Brown in the first quarter, but it's okay to get off to a hot start too. It's okay to shoot the ball. Like a couple of those first quarters in Miami and against Miami, he wasn't really even shooting the ball um, until like the second quarter. So we need to see more active Jason that we need to see 30 point per game, Jason, in this series to make things a little easier. Now they can still win him having 21, but we know he's capable of more. Yeah, I agree. That makes sense. 
So looking ahead, as we mentioned, we still are waiting as of Thursday to see who will win the Cleveland and Orlando series. And then we'll go from there and figure out, you know, how we assess the rest of the second round for the Celtics. So until then, we appreciate you guys listening, still sticking around with us. Of course, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Share with a friend. Share this episode with a Cavs or Magic fan or a Heat fan, whoever. Or a Chaka Khan fan. Or Chaka Khan, yeah. I think they'd appreciate it. I think there are (laughs) many ways to share this. So until next week when we know who the next round will be against. For H. Rod Blakely and Gary Washburn, I'm Kwani Lewis. We appreciate you guys listening. Ain't nobody does me better. You don't have the rights for that. (laughs) 